May I speak in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, please be seated. Good morning, St. Margaret's. Very blessed 13th Sunday after Pentecost to you, and a very uh, happy and blessed Labor Day weekend uh, as well. It's a joy to be together on this long uh, holiday weekend and, and to worship in the house of the Lord. I thought I'd start off this morning with uh, something of a recap. Uh, if you were here last week, you'll recall that I talked uh, about kind of the broad Jesus moved in. Um, in particular, I talked about the social culture, the, the culture of being hosted uh, and of hosting. I talked about how these two distinct but obviously related uh, phenomena, being hosted and hosting, how they were, they were two sides of the same coin. They were each part of a, of a system that was fueled by and based upon the perceived worthiness of the actors involved. A lot has changed in some ways over the past 2,000 years, uh, such that people back then thought the way that we think today. They thought about life in largely transactional terms. So when it came to hosting, they asked the question, you know if I host this dinner or attend that party, what will I get in return? So when it came to social occasions, hosts asked, if I invite this person, will everyone else be impressed? Guests, they asked, if I sit in this spot, will it not merely reflect my social standing but also perhaps advance it as well. One reason why I explored kind of this social context, brighter, uh, broader social reality, is that, you know, without it, I don't think we would have been able to grasp all that Jesus was teaching. So often in the Gospels, so often, uh, there are shadows that sort of loom or threaten just off the page, just out of the frame. You know, shadows that are hinted at, but never fully addressed. And that's why, I mean, last week I, I talked about how, you know, Jesus and just etiquette. It was economy. And how God's economy is so different from our own. I also talked about how in the end, what Jesus was doing is he was pointing us to grace itself. The grace works in ways so different than us. Grace is the perfect gift. It's abundant without obligation. It's precious without possibly ever being earned. That was last week. Uh, I thought I'd offer the recap uh, because many of the same observations I just made apply to this week's gospel text as well. There's more to the images that Jesus shares with us this morning that we might, than we might realize at first glance. Shadows are looming over our text this morning. Shadows are looming over Jesus as he continues to make his way to Jerusalem. Not just our gospel text. I think every text we heard this morning um, is all about choice. Deuteronomy, where God addresses Israel and offers them a choice. And Jesus, this morning, is offering us a choice. But before we can think about that choice, before we can think about how to make a decision, we have to first be informed we have to consider the whole picture. We have to know both where the shadows are as well as where the light might be. Okay, with this in mind, I want to turn to Luke chapter 14. That's where we're going to spend all our time this morning. And even though Jesus is on a perilous journey, the crowds of people that are always in some way or another around Jesus, they appear to be growing counterintuitive as that might seem. I think a lot of this uh, is related to some measure of curiosity on the part of the people. You know, the people 
most likely have heard about the bold predictions that Jesus has been offering about his trip to Jerusalem. You know, they've heard that he was headed to Jerusalem in order that he might suffer and he might die. I think Jesus understands the motives that the people have. He understands that perhaps they're drawn to his side for a variety of reasons. And so as he so often does in the the Gospels, you know, Jesus is more than willing to just put a break on things. I mean, this morning he's actively dissuading the people from following him. His first tool, first thing that that he does, the thing that probably stood out to you right when I started the the passage is Jesus engages in some measure of exaggeration this morning, right? He tells the crowds that to be his disciples, they must first hate their father and their mother, their spouse, their siblings, even their children. Jesus, of course, is not demanding that we engage in conflict with those who are closest to us. Rather, he's using exaggeration in order to make a simple point. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to have what I describe as rightly ordered loves. We have to put first things first. We have to know what it is that truly matters. For the follower of Jesus, what truly matters is the love of God. The love of God has to come first. It's the greatest commandment that we would love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. Now the important thing that I want you to hear from me is that this is more than just a command that we love God with all that we have and all that we are. It's also counsel for us in order that we might live in the way that God intends for us to live. I mean, Jesus says time and again in the Gospels to put the kingdom of God first in order that everything else might be added unto it. The reason why, the reason why it's so important that we have rightly ordered loves is this. By seeking after God's mercy and love and grace first, It's then that we're empowered to to fully and completely love the people and communities that are all around us. I mean, true love is hard, isn't it? I mean, true love gives without taking. It protects without ever suffocating. It lets go as often as it embraces. And to do this, to love in this way, we have to first understand that God alone is the giver of all good things. God alone deserves our ultimate loyalty. God alone is the only one who can ever bear the full weight of who we are. Get this right, Jesus tells us, and we will be set free to love. Set free to love in the way that we were built to love. Second, after inviting them into a life marked by rightly ordered loves, Jesus instructs the people to count the cost. It's here that I want to step back for a moment and I want to consider the shadows that are looming just out of frame. They're just off the page of Luke's gospel. Jesus uses two images to express how important it is that we count the cost. He describes the building of, of, of a great tower, And how one must first estimate the price, understand what it's going to cost. If you want to be able to lay a foundation and then finish the building. Jesus also describes a king preparing to go to war. And how a king will measure his forces and compare them against opposing forces. Grand buildings. And the turmoil of conflict and war. These are two striking images that Jesus is sharing with us. 
And as striking as they are to us in an instant, they would have stood out clear as day to the people that surrounded Jesus 2,000 years ago. You see, the people in Jesus' day, they knew something about long-term building projects as well as the ups and downs, the uncertainties of conflict. Herod the Great, uh, just a warning, I'm going to I'm going to dive into a little bit of history, so um, bear, bear with me if you're not a history buff. I know some people are like, oh, history. Um, Herod the Great, okay, the same Herod who slaughtered the innocents at the birth of Jesus in a bid to kill Jesus, uh, Herod the Great began a massive renovation of the temple in Jerusalem some 20 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. It was so massive Uh, that the work went on for decades, and it was continued on by his sons. It was so comprehensive that the second temple, as many of you might know, it's often referred to as Herod's Temple. People knew something about building a grand building. They also knew something about the uncertainty of war. Uh, The people had long despised their Roman occupiers for good reason. Now, this animosity and this resentment and this anger towards their Roman occupiers, it, it, it boiled and it simmered and it boiled until finally it reached the point of open conflict. And so a very important date in first century Palestine is, is the date of 70 CE. In 70 CE, They were four years into the start of a violent uprising on the part of the Jewish people. They were seven years into life in a perfectly renovated temple. But it all came crashing down in an instant. In 70 CE, the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem completely, including the temple itself. And so much of what the people had longed for, so much of what they had put their trust in, is wiped away in an act of cruelty and violence. I think having a little bit of this history in mind, we can understand what Jesus might be saying. My conviction is that Jesus is teaching us not only to count the cost, but to be so careful about in whom or in what we place our trust. As a matter of fact, counting the cost actually reveals something about in whom or in what we should place our trust. The reality is this. So many of the things that consume the human heart, human projects, human desires, human conflicts, in the end, they can't help but let us down. Unlike God, our projects cannot bear the full weight of our full selves. And Herod the Great, he built building after building after building. Because he wanted desperately to be loved and admired by the people. I think most people in post-Christian America don't even know Herod the Great, his name, his life, his history. And those that do understand him to be connected with some of the greatest atrocities in human history. It doesn't cost us a lot to center ourselves. It doesn't cost us a lot to think constantly about what we want, we deserve, what we'll build, what we'll pursue. But just because something doesn't cost a lot doesn't mean that it's free or doesn't mean that it will give us freedom. Projects have a way of going unfinished. Conflicts have a way of turning on us. Human desires have a way of leading us astray. Now, it's in contrast to this. 
to the centering of ourselves that Jesus uses a rather haunting image this morning. He uses the image of a Roman cross. A symbol of death, Jesus asks his followers to carry their cross and to walk with him all the way to Jerusalem. The reason he does this, the reason why he picks the cross is that he wants to make it so clear to us. He wants to make so clear to us that the cost of following after him is, well, everything. It costs us everything. To follow after Jesus is to be willing to say no to relationships, no to identities, no to projects and dreams, no to our possessions. Those things we consume rather than love. We have to say no to that instinct to put ourselves in the center of it all the center of the worlds, we work so hard that we exhaust ourselves to create. But the great paradox of the Christian faith, the great paradox of becoming a disciple of Jesus is that as we do this, as we say no, in that same moment we also say yes. We say yes to the life that Jesus offers to us. So what I want you to hear from me this morning is this. My brothers and sisters, Jesus this morning is offering us a rather simple choice. Do we place our trust in something that costs nothing but weighs us down and robs us? Or do we place our trust in something that gives life yet costs us everything? I'll say that again. You know, one of the most important decisions that we'll ever make in this world is where we place our trust. Whether it's in something that costs us nothing but weighs us down, or whether it's in something that gives us life but costs us everything. That's the invitation that Jesus is offering to us this morning. It's the invitation that Jesus never stops offering us day by day, week by week, year by year as we make our own journeys with Christ. I'll go ahead and I'll close now with this thought. I want us to hear the words of Jesus for what they are this morning. I want us to count the cost of following him. I want us to weigh the sacrifice of the cross. Understanding that it's a gift of life in and through death itself. And I want us to consider what it might be that Jesus is asking us to forsake. Because as we make this journey, there's always the next step that is waiting for us. There is the next possession that we have that thing that we're consuming instead of loving? Is that a relationship? Is that a project, a a, a material good, a, a dream, a pursuit, an accolade that God is calling us to forsake in order that we might answer the call of discipleship? Whatever it is, whatever that next step might be, I pray that we'd say yes. And I pray that we would know that we do not ever walk by ourselves. The journey we're invited into was already made by Jesus. The city that he stepped into was not just the city where he died. It was the city where he rose to new life. And it's that life that he is waiting to share with us. even now. Amen.